right, Steve here. Uh, I hope you can hear me and see me okay. Do me a favor and just throw a hello in the chat and that way I know you can hear me and you can see me and we can go ahead and get started. So we're gonna be talking about melodic soloing again today and then we're gonna talk about melodic soloing again on Friday. Hey John, John is here. Let's see who else we got here. Omar is here, uh, Rashed is here, Hammerhead Tumnus 712 is here, <laughs> Bernie is here, Ashley is here, Tim is here, Dan, Ozzy, Nico, Ajuka, Cody. Hey, Cody, Jack is here. Awesome. So you have all kinds of people already. This is great. Thank you so much, everybody. Uh, so let's go ahead and get started. We already have a couple hundred people in here, and I don't want to waste your time. Uh, so what we're doing is we're celebrating the release of my guitar course, uh, Melodic Soloing. You're going to find a link over in the chat over there. Nice to see you too, Rashid. Um, so what we're going to be doing today is I... we, we First of all, we've had a couple of live sessions so far. Let's just figure out where we are and then move forward from there. So in the first one, we were talking about how to try and start visualizing your fretboard a bit better, visualizing chords or arpeggios, however you want to think of it, moving across the fretboard. Hey, Kelly. And, uh, and as you develop those, then what we want to do is we want to start learning how to make those connections using some arpeggio ideas. Now, the thing I want to talk about today is bringing back the notes that are not part of those chords, that are not part of those arpeggios. And we are gonna, I'm gonna refer to those as non-chord tones right now. Hey, Christoph. But really, if you just think about it, it's anything other than the, the root and the third and the fifth, the notes that are making this triad, this initial chord. We wanna bring those notes on back, okay? The biggest thing I want you to understand that you can take away from this, hey, Brent, hey, Jack, hey, Doug, hey, Jimmy, is, um, Understanding that if you can start seeing things on your fretboard in multiple levels, you can use those effectively in your playing. Where if you just see everything as one, the problem is oftentimes that everything just sounds the same after a while. Like if I take the A major scale here and I do this. And I can make some patterns and things. Hey, Patricia. Hey, Sarkhan. And I want all of that. I want all of those kind of things, no doubt about it. But I also want to learn how to separate out some things. Now, the, the one thing we learned how to separate out were triads. Learning to see the A chord and the D chord and the F sharp minor chord, that sort of thing. Right? Seeing those and being able to separate those out and learning that you can do this across the fretboard in any position, that's up to you on what you're able to visualize. Learning to visualize these chord shapes or these arpeggios, learning to visualize the scale at the same time. So today what I want to do is I want to come back to the scale itself and start adding in notes that are not part of that initial triad. Hey, Leah. So let's say, for instance, I took this, this is the same backing track I've been using this whole time. And I do want to remind you that on Friday, um, we will be having another video at 10 a.m. Pacific, but I will not, I won't, I won't be live. Now, I've already pre-recorded it. I did it this morning, so you're going to see the same shirt again. Uh, I pre-recorded it this morning, and it will happen on Friday. Uh, I just won't, it won't be live. But I did want to make that because I wanted to finish up our conversation so you have something to practice for the weekend if you've got extra time. Hey, Marak. Hey, Elias. So let's listen to our song a little bit here. Here's our A. And D. F sharp minor. And D. Okay. Now, we started off talking about some really basic things where we could do something like play a single note and we could play it over all of those chords, right? We could find a note and just play it like A. And I could just play that over everything that I'm doing, okay? Uh, we might do something where we hear that progression and we, we do a bend or something, right? And we hold that bend. Right, whatever it might be, okay? There's lots of things that we can do. So always remind yourself that melody doesn't require you to have to move every time a chord pops up, okay? Sometimes what happens is you'll hold that note or you'll hold whatever it is that you're doing and then when the chord shifts over, the note still relates to that, okay? And it sounds wonderful. 
Well, today what I want to talk about is that even though that chord might shift over and now uh, that note doesn't, it isn't part of that triad, it's still okay. You just want to keep reminding yourself to create some sort of um, purpose in your solo. I don't want to say a theme, but, but a purpose where some notes really do shine more than other notes. That doesn't require you to do it all the time, and it doesn't require you to only focus on those. You want to have fun. You want to do your thing. Hey, Mark. Hey, Andreas. Uh, Andreas is here from Germany, New Guinea. Uh, Urban is here, David. Hey, everybody. So nice to see everybody. So let's go ahead and get started here. And what I want to do is just show you a couple things. Now, the first thing I'm going to do here as I rewind this is I'm going to go to the note uh, A. And we already talked about how that A would work over all three of those chords. Okay? So let me just play that note for you. Nothing exciting here yet. So it works. Now watch what happens here. What I'm going to do is instead of just staying on the A, when the D chord comes up, what I'm going to do is I'm going to move back to the note G sharp. Now G sharp doesn't exist in the chord D. Okay? So G sharp would be like the fourth. If you know anything about your theory, and it's okay if you don't, but if you know anything about your theory, it would technically be the fourth. But the most important thing I want you to understand is that it's not part of the triad. It's not part of the chord we've been talking about for the last couple of days. So now listen to this and see what your ear thinks of this. And you can certainly respond and tell me what you think of it. Hey, buddy. Uh, so let's go back. And here we go. Now listen to this. Now, it probably didn't sound too bad, right? There's a little bit of dissonance that happens. There's a little bit of a, maybe not dissonance, maybe maybe tension is a better word, okay? There's a little bit of tension that happens. Hey, Dean from Florida, uh, there's a little bit of tension, and that's okay because then I can resolve that. That's right, Wyatt says create some tension. That's exactly right, Wyatt. And that tension is beautiful. Now, if we're creating that intention, that tension, uh, unintentionally by playing and never knowing what we're doing, that's where the problem comes in is that sometimes we can never define ourselves. We can never step into that, that shoe and make it really feel like we know what we're doing. It just feels like we're kind of all over the place, you see? But if, I, if I'm intentionally trying to move away from something, and it might be happening in real time, it might be something that I've, I've pre-planned, whatever it might be, that's entirely up to us, but it does create a really nice sound. Okay, let me try that again just so you can kind of hear this. Here we go. Here it comes. And here it is again. Okay. Now I think that sounds really nice. But what I'd like to do is, as we've talked about in the last few sessions, is I'd like to spice this up a little bit. I need a little bit more going on here. So what I'm going to do is over the F sharp minor, I'm not going to go back here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave and go somewhere else. So here's what I'm going to do. Over the A, I'm playing A. Over the D, I'm going to play this G sharp to create that tension. And then what I'm going to do for the F sharp is I'm going to go to F sharp. So it resolves. So we had this comfort, this tension, and then this comfort, okay? And going to that, I'm going to go to that F sharp with this little, this little hammer on here. Because again, I tend to use a lot of these, that sort of thing when I play. I use a lot of these hammer-on, pull-off, slidey stuff, just because I, I love the way that that sounds. So let me play that for you now, just adding in that. Here we go. Okay, now we're going to resolve back. And then... Okay, now there's D again. So I went back to that G sharp. But it sounds a little more, in my opinion, it has a little more tension the second time around. So I have to ask myself, well, is that what I want to do? 
or maybe I want to resolve it to something. Watch, here's a couple other options. Watch this now. Let me go back. Here we go. Here comes that D, so what do I want to do? Well, So you see how I moved into another position and I started making some more connection. So I went down to the D, literally the D, and then I, I uh, resolved it to the major third of the A chord. Just again, it, it, I'm not trying to talk fancy or anything, I'm just resolving it to another note of the A chord when the A comes around. The point is, I know that the A chord is coming and I'm aware of when these are coming, so I'm thinking about creating some tension and then releasing that a little bit, okay? And then maybe doing something different. So if I wanted to create a melody for a particular song, if you were writing a song and you wanted to create a melody, uh, maybe it's a guitar melody, maybe it's a vocal melody for a chorus, whatever, you could certainly do this sort of thing to develop that, okay? Uh, Lee, right now what I'm doing is I'm using the Kemper, he asked about the tone, I'm, I'm using a Kemper, and I'm actually using a free preset or a free profile that you can download on the Kemper. It's a Dr. Z profile, that's what I'm using. It's one of my favorite profiles and it didn't cost me a penny. Um, I just changed the delay and reverb. I have a, a kind of a common delay and reverb that I tend to use. Patricia, the backing track that I'm using right now is from a company called Elevated Jam Tracks and you can buy their stuff over at bandcamp.com. That's what I did is I just buy the packs. You can actually buy all of their stuff for, I forget how much I paid, if it was like $40 or something and I got a, you know, hundreds of, of backing tracks from them. So they're just, they're just awesome backing tracks, but that's what this is from. Andrew says, Cage Made Simple is awesome. Finally, the cage system makes sense. Uh, that's awesome, Andrew. I appreciate you saying that. I think it's a really important thing to learn um, f depending on what you're going to use it for. Like for me, I tend to use it, again, I know I told you this, but Tim Pierce and I talked about the cage system and how important it is to be able to visualize your chords as you're moving around the fretboard whether you're seeing it as theory or whether you're seeing it as shapes is entirely up to you, but really trying to learn to make that connection. So let me show you another tension and release element and see what you think of this one, okay? Let me know what you think of this. So what I'm gonna do now is instead of starting off with a, a comfort, which is the A over the A, I'm gonna start off with some tension. I'm gonna go to the major seventh. So I'm gonna go to that G sharp that I played, but I'm going to do it right away over the A chord. Okay, now what you're gonna experience is tension to begin with, and then when the D chord comes up, I'm gonna move over to that A, and it's gonna release that tension. So see what you think of this. Okay, so here we go. So let's see what you think of that. You can always throw something in the chat. I would love to know what you think of that. So the first note, or the first chord, I'm playing that G sharp over A, which is creating this tension. And then the D comes up, I'm going to the, the right note right next to it, G sharp to A, because that A is part of the D chord. Then F sharp minor comes up, I go back to the G sharp. Now over F sharp minor, G sharp doesn't, doesn't fit in the triad. Okay, so I, I'm, I'm sorry if I butcher your name here, but Josh says it sounds good, Larry, Hi, Steve. Uh, Cody says, to my ear, starting with the tension sounds nicer. That's awesome, Cody. Thank you. Perfect tone in that track. Cool. Thank you, JR. Yeah, it all depends on what it is that you like, but I want you to be aware that it's there. It's available to you to use at any point in time. So as I'm playing this, this note is creating tension, that major seventh, and then I'm heading over to the D hitting over the A over the D chord. And then over the F sharp, I'm going back to that G sharp, which doesn't fit in 
the chord F sharp minor, because F sharp minor would have F sharp, A, C sharp. I'm playing G sharp. So I'm technically playing the second is what I'm playing, or the ninth you might call it. Let me get my hair out of the way there. Uh, and then when the, the D comes back, I'm heading back to that A and resolving it again. So we've got a reverse tension happening here. Okay, does that make sense? Uh, back in track reminds me of one of my favorite Andy James tracks. That's awesome. Okay, so let me try that one more time so you can hear this. Here we go. See how in the end, if I simply go to something like, I go to that C sharp at the end and resolve it, it all feels good again. So you can use this tension and this, again, we can call it tension and release, or we can just call it tension and comfort, right? Whatever you think of. Hey, Francis, if that helps you a little bit. Uh, Robert says, love that bend note. Yeah, and, and uh, to be honest with you, it's something that you're going to see me do over and over and over is when the minor chord in a major chord progression like that comes up. For me, it's my rock and roll chance. When that minor chord comes up, I tend to go with a... a I, not always, but I tend to go with like a bend or maybe a bluesy thing or something like that. I really like to do that when the minor chord comes up because the minor gives me that... I could do over that F sharp minor and then I can just return back again, which if you think about it is another form of dynamic contrast that I'm always talking about is, you know, even the scales that I'm choosing. So over that minor, I'm going a bit more pentatonic, a little, little more uh, bluesy, maybe something like that. Okay. Uh, let's see here. I don't know if I can answer this, Alicia, but I'll try. This is a really newbie question. But so far, I've learned only a few things on the electric guitar, like memorizing a few scales, minor, major, pentatonic. How can I learn to play like this? Well, by studying things like this, right? I mean, the journey of guitar, anybody, many, many people here can tell you, the journey of learning how to play guitar is, is a lifelong thing. And part of it is implementation, bringing in ideas. Okay, and again, you guys hear me talk about these buckets all the time, but it's bringing in ideas, okay? And then you develop these ideas, whatever they are. If you bring in way too many ideas, I don't wanna get off on a tangent, but if you bring in way too much information and then you try and develop everything that you're bringing in or you're constantly every day piling in new information, you can't, you, your, your brain and your, your body is not gonna allow you to take all of that and move it into the, uh, establishment, the rudimentary place, right? Here we're, we're funneling in information and then we need to take it and we need to figure out how to play it, how to manipulate it. And then we go into our third bucket, which is the creative bucket. How do we make it sound musical? So if you're learning things like major and minor pentatonic, one of the things you need to do is you need to make sure that you understand what it is that you're trying to do. And then you start simply learning. Like uh, Alicia, one thing that I would say is um, if you go on YouTube or anything like that, you'll, you'll see me uh, talk about meandering. And meandering is a great technique to just start learning how to move, how to, like even with a song like this, this is an A major slash F sharp minor, right? That's what it is. So you could take your scale and just brainlessly, aimlessly move around and see how well you know all your positions. See how well your technique is in, in being able to play at this tempo, that sort of thing. And now we're at a place where we're adding in logic back on top of that. So for all of you, hopefully that helps you a little bit, but it, it takes a long time to learn how to do this stuff, okay? Uh, is there a bend on the guitar, but it's a, like a double stop? Well, you can do a bend. You can do a, a bend and a double stop. You know? Things like that in your solo, and you'll get that kind of southern rock sort of thing. Yeah, you're welcome. So anyway, hopefully that helps you a little bit in understanding that. So now, if we think about this core tone versus non-core tone thing, and really, again, without getting, because some of you might go, well, a seventh could technically be a core tone. Totally. I'm just saying, moving away from the standard root third fifth and trying to add something else into it, 
okay, to create a little bit of that tension. It sounds quite nice. So let me play a little bit for you here and just let you hear the, the resolve and the tension, okay? So here we go. See, I added both. So I got to think about that. See how right there, I just went into something that was repetitive, right? There's another thing I can do is make something that sounds You know, something like that. So now all of a sudden what I'm doing is I'm trans, I'm, I'm sort of, uh, uh, I shouldn't say trans, but I'm, I'm moving, I was gonna say transferring, but really I'm just moving out of the melodic stage and I'm moving into something else where I like the sound of that repetition. You know, I might do a repetition like this. I'll just keep this going here. Here we go. So repetition like this. See how I went half step and then uh, I'm going up a whole step. So right there, I'm bending up a whole step and then I'm bending up another half step on top of that whole step. And I could do that both times again over both of those chord changes. Listen again. That felt like I should go down. I'll do it again. Then. So like there. I was creating this kind of motif on the bottom. And I went there over the A, and then I went to that note over the D, which again, doesn't match, okay? It would be like the sixth is what I was adding in right there. But what it was doing was setting up the motion to the F sharp so I could do my bend that I love to do, right? So if I went. And then, and then maybe I'll do that step and a half bend on top of that one. You see? So let me try that once. So you can kind of hear what that whole thing sounds like. that tension. So I'm just trying to kind of tie the ideas together as I'm playing, looking for some different things. Now, everything I'm doing isn't perfect. Like there's some things I could certainly go in there and uh, clean up, but I'm just improvising. I'm just looking for ideas as I play. And if I was really trying to build something for songwriting or something like that, I might go in and, and kind of brush that up around there. Um, the, let's see here. What do you do to get out of a totally wrong note you hit by accident? You just keep going. 
the thing I know about hitting wrong notes is that everybody on the planet hits them. The, the thing, if you're performing like, and anybody that's, that's done a lot of live shows will tell you, when you're playing, when you hit a wrong note, like if you, you can do a number of things. An easy thing to do is obviously just to bend it until you hit the right note. You can keep going whatever. But as the performer, that note kind of gets stuck in your mind and it can play weird mind games with you. The audience... It's all happening in real time. They don't really care. You know what I mean? They're enjoying the whole experience. It's not just the one note you played. There's a band playing. There's all kinds of things going on at the same time. And I really had an experience with this when I was younger and playing in a band where I used to record the shows and then I'd listen to them afterwards. And I'd find all these things. I'd go, man, I didn't do that right. And I didn't like the way that sounded. And it really became very clear to me at that point in my life that what I was doing was being really, really hard on myself because the audience isn't going back and psychoanalyzing everything you did. They're just enjoying the show, the whole entire experience, the lights, the sound, the people, the friends, you know, the whole thing, not your one note. So, and I'm not being weird about it. I'm just saying everybody on the planet hits wrong notes. Every single person on the planet hits wrong notes. Okay. You smile, you shrug it off and you move on. If it's a really bad note, you got two choices. You either reiterate that same note to pretend like you meant to do it, or you just bend out of it. Watch this. If I do something like this, I'm going to play a wrong note. Right? I mean, what else are you going to do? You know, if I go to that, I'm going to hit it again. Same bad note. I might go into a bend next to it to try and make it whatever, but it happens. It's not a big deal. It happens all the time. So don't let those things weird you out so much because they, they just, they happen. Okay. So hopefully that makes sense. So now what we've talked about are a couple things. We talked about uh, using notes that are not the root third and fifth to create that tension, but we still have developed an understanding of hierarchy. We have these notes that are part of the chord and we want to try and emphasize these. And then here's the notes that are not part of that chord. We're not just putting them together and doing this. For the entire solo, right? We can do that sometimes, no doubt about it. But we've learned that we're trying to separate this and find things to really emphasize within the context of our solo to give our solo purpose. We're adding these notes back in now to create tension. Okay? So the next thing... Yeah, everybody, even Satriani, everybody, everybody on the planet, every guitar player you've ever heard makes mistakes, okay? Um, and then we also talked about how over the minor chord, I tend to go back to a pentatonic structure a bit to really give it more of that kind of bluesy feel. And you'll hear that, like even when I'm jamming with this thing, if I was doing something where I'm creating a... And then here... little nod to uh, Pink Floyd's mother. That's one of my favorite solos on the planet. And I'm not even that big of a Pink Floyd fan, uh, but Mother by Pink Floyd has got one of the greatest solos for me forever for a melodic solo. Absolutely love it. So anyway, hopefully that can kind of make sense to you adding all these things in. And then on Friday, which I won't be here, but I did record it um, for you on Friday. I'm going to be talking about the difference between vertical and horizontal playing. Uh, you could practice wrong note recoveries. I would try and practice right notes more than wrong notes. And if you hit a wrong note, again, the better you get at this whole thing, guys, it, the, you're not going to hit that many wrong notes. It happens. It happens to everybody. But it's, you know, it, it doesn't happen that often as long as you learn your scales and you understand what key you're in and you understand what you're doing. And, and again, for, for those of you that have played a lot live, you don't jump on stage with a band in front of a very large audience and all of a sudden start trying to play avant-garde in the wrong key and do things you've never done before. You know, that's what practice is all about. Like if you're practicing songs, 
you're learning how to play things and then you're learning how to improvise over the things that you play. That's, you just practice over and over and over. That's how you do this stuff. And every once in a while you screw up and make a mistake, but it's a mistake. It's not like you're practicing or playing in the complete wrong key. You know, very few of us would go, all right, get 10,000 people together and I'm going to go up on stage and don't tell me what the song is. Don't tell me the key. Don't tell me the chords. Blindfold me and now I'm going to improvise, you know. We, we, we don't really do that. You know, I mean, that's, that's why we try and get better by learning things and getting better at, at our craft. So anyway, everybody take care, stay positive, and uh, I won't see you on Friday, but you'll see me on Friday. So please join me 10 a.m. Pacific on Friday and uh, make sure to check out the Melodic Soloing course, see if it's something that uh, can help you, and I certainly hope it does. Stay positive, stay safe, and have a great uh, Easter weekend if you celebrate Easter, and I will see you uh, again next week. Okay. All right. Take care, everybody.